Prescription products require completion of an online medication consultation with an independent healthcare provider through the LifeMD platform and are only available if prescribed. Subscription required. Individual results may vary. Additional restrictions apply at LifeMD.com. Read all warnings before using GLP-1s. Side effects may include a risk of thyroid C-cell tumors. Do not use GLP-1s if you or your family have a history of thyroid cancer. If you've struggled for years to lose weight and have given up hope, did you know you can now access GLP-1 prescription medications through LifeMD? LifeMD is now offering eligible patients online access to GLP-1s, the breakthrough prescription medication that can help you lose body fat and weight. Listen to what people are saying. You just take your shot. It doesn't feel like you're on a diet. What I wasn't expecting it to do was to shut off the food noise. This was life-altering, and if I can do it, I feel like anybody can do it. And here's the best part. Your insurance may cover 100% of the cost of your medication. So go to TryLifeMD.com to have your eligibility checked right now. Get started today at TryLifeMD.com. That's T-R-Y-L-I-F-E-M-D.com. Visit Avery.com, A-V-A-R-Y, for the most up-to-date news and information on Team Avery. 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 This is The Gala Show. I'm your reporter on the beat, Gala Avery. On this episode, you may know my guest as a member of the comedy group No That's Okay, the musician behind albums such as You Got Me, or the director behind short films such as The Incarnate. But here on The Gala Show, I simply know him as that guy who shoots on video, <laughs> Gabriel Bernini. <laughs> hey, Gabe. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. You're uh, very welcome. Yeah. Now now that we've figured out that you're Gabe or Gabriel yeah, beforehand, exactly. yeah. it's all working out. Yeah. So before we bring up the topic for today, I have a question for you. What is one album that everyone should listen to? Oh, wow. One album. Mm. Uh, oh, my gosh. This is exciting. <laughs> I'm going to say, um, well, I'm going to say Let It Be, the Beatles album, That's Let It Be. That's not a bad choice. No, I think it's, I think that especially now with this insane documentary that came out about it, that uh, that George, Lu- er, <laughs> George Lucas made, it's, uh, what's his name? Peter Jackson made. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, uh, that would be special. I know, I was going to say, I would love it. a George yeah, Lucas. Yeah, he's going to uh, redo it. That would be a, a remake would be, it, just like yeah, exactly. <laughs> the sequel. Just the same footage, <laughs> a different Just told line. him, I mean, yeah. he totally would. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have like a favorite song from the Beatles? Um, oh, God. Um, I, well, you know, that song, uh, the the song Let It Be specifically was one that I learned on piano. I think it was the first song I ever learned. So mm-hmm. it's a big, it was a big deal to me um, growing up. But then just that that album is really special. And it's also insane to get to see that footage of them making it because they're like just goofing around the entire time. Because like, they're just ha- friends. Yeah, they're just having so much fun. And I think that everybody like me and a lot of musicians have sort of felt like oh, these geniuses like for our whole lives just kind of looked up to them as like they're doing magic in there and then to kind of get to lift that veil and just see that they're just goofing around the entire time was really amazing so now when I listen to that record I really like it's like very relaxing to just be like you can make this kind of music and just have a good time and you know kind of live as kind of a normal artist and see that you know these artists were just doing what came naturally to them and they came up with this stuff um so yeah i I like that record yeah for me i'm totally a yellow submarine album like movie album girl i grew up watching yellow submarine and so for me it's hey bulldog and nowhere man yeah like i'm like bulldog (laughs) i'm i'm rocking out to that yeah (laughs) <laughs> now, as always, my guest gets to bring their topic to the mic. Gabe, what's the topic for today, and why did you decide to choose it? Well, I we so my partner Alex and I have been making these short films, um, and now we're gonna jump into making our first feature. I know, congratulations! Thank you, thank you. And we're, so we're doing. We've been doing a lot of horror genre stuff, and um, so we've been really excited by just in general, just exploitation films. Um, and we were excited to talk about kind of the novelty of exploitation and how we're kind of trying to bring like 
a, a new version of that into our own um, community of sort of making exploitation movies um, just kind of starting for our friends and for, for ourselves and making them for screenings that we can host ourselves. Um, and then, you know, seeing where that takes us. But first, time for a commercial break. Back by popular demand, the Video Archives merch store is up and running. Get your favorite t-shirts, hats, notebooks, stickers, and more at videoarchivesmerch.com. You know me. I write all my notes in the notes on Cinema Notebook, the Gall edition, of course. Check out videoarchivesmerch.com to get yours today. When you work in tech at Cox, you get to do meaningful work every day. You get to be the biker who codes as fast as he rides, crafting advanced tech solutions that transform car buying, or a guitarist who develops harmonious apps and websites, connecting people to people and businesses, all in real time. A savvy soccer mom running solution sets as passionately as she runs gameplays. Be the super secret keeper. Designing cybersecurity systems to protect private data and websites. A planet protector. Expanding EV battery life and inventing more ways to build a better future for all. When you work in tech at Cox, you get to do career-defining work that solves the greatest problems of our time. Join us and connect to work that improves lives, including yours. Learn more about our family of businesses at cox.career slash tech. Hey, thanks so much for being a loyal listener. If you want to keep up with me off mic, make sure to follow me on Instagram at Gala Avery. And we're back. Uh, you heard it here first. That's our topic for today. We're going to be talking. Concise honestly, enough. it yeah. is. We're going to be talking about exploitation films and also how new young filmmakers can make them. Because yeah. I personally believe that exploitation is one of the most important genres for indie cinema. So I'm going to put 30 minutes on the clock right. and our time starts now. <laughs> so how would you define an exploitation film? Well, I think that, you know, there's kind of the two sides of it. There's the one side which is making movies that can make money because they have certain elements that people know make money in the theaters, like um, just violence and uh, maybe some sexual... Nudity, uh, nudity yeah, boobage. Some, yes, exactly. And then <laughs> maybe also some sort of novelty aspect of just you know promising some sort of horror or some sort of um, devious Like genre. Theme. Yeah. Something that's going to shock people in the theater. Um, and so I think that there's that part of it, which um, is usually based to kind of get people to into the theater and get them in the door, which is, um, you know, that's exciting to me that basically you can, if you just put these things in those movies, then you'll get people in the door. And that's kind of all you have to do is mm -hmm. kind of get those things in, on the screen. But then there's the other side of it, which is the independent filmmaking part, which is that as long as you have those things, you can also do whatever else you want to kind of make the movie that you are into. And those are always the big surprises when you're watching weird exploitation movies where, you know, you've got all the nudity aspects and the violence, but then you have like a strange dance scene or like a dance number or like just extreme music choices or uh, or or strong political messages too. Yes, that's, yes, that's totally. probably one of my favorite things about our exploitation because like black exploitation is obviously one of my favorite genres and so right. i love um like this movie brotherhood of death i'm not sure if you've seen it i haven't seen that um one. it's my favorite black exploitation film it's about a group of brothers that come back well brothers like yeah colloquially yeah. brothers that come back from vietnam and when they come back to their small town it's just like rampant with racism and there's right. like voter fraud and so they're basically 
fighting the war now on American soil. And I love it because the whole conversation then is like voters' rights. And right. it's embedded in this really cool exploitation film. And so like it allows totally. you to think about it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. There, we've been watching a lot of like trauma movies recently. Yeah. Have you seen the new one? No, I haven't. Yeah, I've heard a few people have seen the new Toxie. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, it's a new Toxic Avenger. Yeah. Oh, wow. It's a, it's, I think it's, it's a new Toxie. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Don't quote me on it. I think I've it. heard about that. That <laughs> I heard that it was in... The, it was getting made or something yeah but, so well okay well i'll keep my eye out yeah, keep your eye yeah. out for it <laughs> but yeah like those those movies are like as schlocky as they get and as goofy as they get but they also have these messages about you know pollution and things like that yeah with toxic important. avenger and yeah so it's so cool that you can kind of um offer both of those things within a movie and i think that for me, it also really lowers the stakes of what a movie has to be, mm -hmm. um, where, you know, it doesn't have to be this magnum opus masterpiece movie. It can be this thing that just serves these specific needs. And fun. And fun. Yeah. Just a good time. And and I think watching them even, it, it gives me like, I'm more relaxed watching it, you know, and especially right now like maybe i'm not feeling like putting on like a movie that i have to really you know put all my focus into and, and really think like, about yeah yeah and really like feel and get emotionally attached to the characters and stuff like sometimes i really just want to put on something that is just pure fun pure yeah. schlock yes yeah in the best way possible yeah and more, more recently that's pretty much all i'm watching <laughs> no that? i mean i can relate completely because yeah. like one of my favorite things to do is just kind of like find a random movie i mean back in the day it would have been on vhs you would have just right. gone to the store and picked it out and now you can do that we have some stores yeah. here in la which i love um, but also I go on YouTube and I just kind of like search for like old movies and then I kind of just like I'm just gonna put this one on like, yeah. why not let's yeah. just try it. it's like there's no uh, reason why I shouldn't try it out so why yeah not? I think that you know the a big shift for me was um, was the store whammy analog mm -hmm. in Echo Park um, because you're right by it I'm right near it and I, I walk there like three times a week <laughs> and I just kind of I like to browse through the movies and there's so many there that I haven't seen um, that like have these big actors and stuff that I love and I'm like what I've never heard about this movie like how is this just kind of gone under the radar and, and it's, it's and it's lost it's stuck on VHS yeah. is the other thing and I think I always say this that people think that because of the internet like everything's out there and no there's actually way less stuff that used to be there right than there is so. yeah exactly and so it's it's also just you know the experience of buying a VHS and being like, okay, I've got a, I've got it in my hand. I've so got I own cover. it. I own it. I get to put it in my shelf and it looks awesome. I get to read the back and then I go home and, you know, I'm, ex I'm going to watch that movie. Like I don't have to look through the streamer and like find yeah. which one. And every time I pick a movie on a streamer, I'm always thinking I should have watched that other movie that I oh, was really? looking at. Yeah. I'm always like, Oh, I, you know, this was the wrong choice. <laughs> but if you have it in VHS, like you've actually made that purchase. And yeah. also, uh, I think it's kind of cool because like when you display your objects, yeah. they kind of tell other people who you are. Yeah, totally. Because then when exactly. they come over to your house and they see your shelf and they can browse through and then they can be like, oh, what's this? And you can pull it out and you can say, oh, this is a movie. I bought it here. Yes. I've seen it. I really like it. I don't. There is a story behind it. I think one really good example of like an exploitation filmmaker that is not available on the Internet is Russ yeah. Meyer. Oh, wow. I mean, yeah, none of his right. stuff is available on the internet. Actually, yeah. Vixen, the only way you can watch Vixen yeah. online is through Pornhub, <laughs> which is crazy to me that it's like uploaded on yeah, Pornhub. And that's I mean, kind of awesome, actually. I think maybe we should start make putting our movies up on Pornhub. <laughs> on Pornhub. I mean, it is an X rated film. I don't know if you've seen Vixen. If I you haven't, haven't no. oh my God, you need to see Russ okay. Meyer. Russ Meyer's, I mean, he has all like the, he has like super Vixen and all that yeah, stuff. But yeah. Vixen is my favorite. It's X rated. Okay. And it's exactly what you were saying. It's like, there's so it's like a sex film yeah but there's so much sex like she's like this woman that just like loves having sex and she's, yeah, yeah. she's having sex with everyone yeah but amazing. then all of a sudden there is like a plane hijacking and there's like a communist yeah. like a thing <laughs> against communism yeah and it's just like this awesome fun ride i actually hear wait i have i just here under my table i have video watchdog beyond the valley of the dolls and amazing. stuff and it's like yeah so when is that printed? Is that a new thing? No, this or? is. I think this is an older one. Oh, Someone, sick. I think Frankie Latina. I don't know if you've met Frankie Latina. I don't know. He used to be my tape guy, and oh, now okay. he lives here in LA, and <laughs> so he's had all the swaps. I have yet oh, to meet I him. Have I have yet to meet him though, which is really okay. funny. But <laughs> now I got all my. That's awesome. Oops, oh. on the floor goes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, the the 
that whole thing of like you know just throwing whatever you want in the movie after it's got that stuff after it ha- if it's just a movie of mostly sex then you know People whatever are gonna watch it. whatever else is in there is just extra points you yeah. know do you think the internet has kind of changed though how people want exploitation because like back in like the video store days there was right. no internet so like if you wanted to see nudity or any of that kind of stuff you kind or violence you had to go to the store and buy right. an exploitation film and watch it um and nowadays you can kind of just like look up like boobs yeah exactly yeah i mean certainly i think especially for sort of the you know teenage boy market i'm sure that that's a big difference but what's interesting is that i think that that kind of gets us into what would this new era of exploitation mean you know because i think that people would have an interest in these kinds of films for a different reason than Mm -hmm. just being a teenage boy and wanting to go see the movie for that reason only i think that you know it would be a whole new context of why they want to go see that film i think mainly just because there's they're not really being made there's not yeah and and they should be because it would be fun to go to those theaters and and see a new toxic avenger or something yeah it's really weird to me that these movies aren't being made because for me as i said earlier like i find exploitation is like the quintessential indie cinema right and so it kind of feels like a large portion of indie cinema is just not being made which kind of makes me nervous in a weird way i mean i i think also there's maybe it's with the rise of also like film school and Mm -hmm. stuff that like there's more of a, a push towards sort of being an artist and and sort of having this sort of idea of making your magnum opus making like something really incredible which is awesome and people should you know strive to make whatever they want but i like the idea of striving to make something that is insane and like comes across as like you know kind of a schlocky movie that is all pieced together in like a very handmade yeah handmade makeshift sort of low budget way yeah i think it's interesting that you bring up that the film school thing because you're right for a long time there was really no film school there was just the pipeline of studio and like you'd start off at the bottom and you'd work your way up and you'd become the first ad and then eventually you'd become a director and then after the Hayes code and all that stuff kind of like ended um it really was just like people doing like these like indie cinema like roger corman rose up and all this stuff and then we fell into film school where there's like for me there's several eras of film school like one Mm -hmm. we had film school where people were like learning and then you have like the george lucas and the john carpenter who made their like really amazing films at film school like thx and then also dark star with dan o'bannon which Mm -hmm. i find is pretty handmade and yeah but not quite exploitation Mm -hmm. it's just more like handmade science fiction which science fiction and exploitation kind of go very similar to me in the same vein but after those guys made these like amazing movies and i'm sure there's other directors that i could cite um film school kind of changed mm-hmm. yeah. where like you're people not have a different people have a completely different expectation and also like what they teach you at film school is completely different than like what the directors of those years were taught right even the master's programs um through all these other things it's like the pipeline is different. The teachers are different. You're not shooting on film anymore, right. which is really strange to me because yeah. now it's like, why do you need film school? If you have an iPhone, Yeah, you can just right. go make a movie. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the big factors of making our project. Um, it's was, called Blood Barn, right? Yeah. So Blood Barn is, the, is our big feature that we're going to make. Um, this month I'm actually leaving in less than a week to go do the pre-production Wait, so where excited. are you filming we're in Massachusetts where I'm Fantastic. from yeah. um, it, it, we're shooting at this big farm there that we have access to that's so great. that's sort of the yeah, that's another thing with exploitation you just got to take what you get yes, and then exactly. you got like right did you have the the farm first and then you wrote the exactly. script that's, yeah it was the impetus for the whole picture yeah that's awesome <laughs> yeah um, but so the the whole thing of like we, we shot all of these short films on um, this little VHSC camera. Mm-hmm. And I think that that has been a huge <laughs> thing for our films in general because it was a huge limitation on what we could do. All of the audio is overdubbed. Everything is done. Which is after... really difficult. Yeah. People yeah. <laughs> don't realize like overdubbing, it's, a, it's an art and a skill. We yeah, take it for granted. It, totally. And it's also you know, it gives it a very specific quality that you can't kind of get away from. You have to commit, basically. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of commitment going on with our projects where we're like, well, we can only do this, so we're going to do that, you know, and stick with it and um, work around it. 
And I think that that has given the project a really sort of unique uh, whole tone that people have responded to. And it's been very strange to watch it play in sort of film festivals. Like we've done a few shows. In your short films, yeah. With, with different short films playing before and after. And, you know, a lot of people's shorts look incredible nowadays, you know, because they shoot on these really beautiful cameras. And, and especially if they're out here in L.A., there, you know, there's a lot of people who are really serious and professional about. And have access to a lot of different people yeah, and items. Absolutely. So they're making these like really high production projects. And then ours comes on and it's shot on VHS and it looks insane and it sounds crazy. But there's something that people really respond to with it, which is like just... I don't know. I don't feel uh, insecure about it at all. Oh, it's you like, should. And I don't think you should. I mean, I've seen your shorts. I saw one of them in front of Troll 2 over at Brain Dead. Yeah. And uh, for me, it's also like when it's shot on VHS, one, it's super nostalgic, especially for us right. kids that grew up with VHS or right. uh, even kids that didn't grow up with VHS have a nostalgia for real things. Totally. I also think video looks to me i think it looks great yeah but two i think also people really like try to ape that look uh -huh. and yes, are like totally. how do i filter my iphone footage right. to make it look like vhs how do i add that grain on and it's like well you don't have to you just have to come get a yeah. like a recorder yeah exactly. and go do it yourself yeah yeah they're cheap i mean yeah. the camera we have two of these cameras they were like 40 bucks each you know? see that yeah there's no <laughs> barrier for entry anymore yeah yeah so how did you decide to shoot on VHS, like on video? We, we really just, we saw these two Mario Bava movies at um, a, a secret movie club yeah. uh, screening, like uh, last year, it was last October. And we went to the screening and it was double feature. It was awesome. You know, it was just like super inspiring because the movies were so simple. They were all overdubbed. And we were like, we should just make something for Alex's birthday to do like a fun screening with our friends. And so we made the first short film and we shot it just in, in two nights. And we had, uh, I, I'm a musician as well, so I have a little studio in my house and we had my band come over and we made a soundtrack for it. And that took like, you know, two hours of us kind of just jamming. Like the Beatles. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let it be style. It was, yeah, it just kind like, of was like that. We were yeah. goofing around, you know, watching the footage and kind of just jamming. And... Yeah, just having fun. And so we made the soundtrack and then we did the overdubs. And the whole thing was so fun. It was so easy. And we had a blast doing it. And then we screened it and everyone was so excited about it and so supportive. So we got offered at that screening um someone offered to make us like a digital monster for another movie if we wanted to and another person offered for us to use this big crazy house that he was staying in um to shoot in as a location so we took both of those opportunities and made two more short films um and that makes the triple thriller that we that we put together which is like our and you distributed on VHS. We did, yeah. What was that process like? Um, well, so because there's like there's this whole thing going on, like oh, there is a last movie made on VHS, yeah, History yeah. of Violence, yeah. Which, yeah, that's the last movie like distributed by like a, a big studio on VHS, but VHS is still being made. Yeah, totally. Well, there's this company in DC called Retro Release, mm -hmm. and they uh, we connected with them. Um, and they basically, yeah, offered to print it for us. So we, we have been distributing it on VHS, which is super exciting because it's sort of the way it's meant to be watched. Um, and we've just been kind of, I think it's because I come from the music world and mm -hmm. Alex comes from the writing world of sort of hosting shows and doing things very sort of, uh, grassroots. We are used to sort of, uh, hosting shows booking shows and selling merch doing it yourself <laughs> yeah and doing it ourselves so we've just been having these screenings we did a couple in new york we did one in my hometown uh we've done a bunch in la and it's just been fun to have people come out and we sell shirts we sell vhs and you know you know we bring beer and and have people watch beer these and movies. pizza and yeah. watch the movies yeah. yeah and it's just been so much fun and people are so supportive of it that it's just snowballed and we just kind of want to keep it going and so now that's kind of led us into doing our big feature which has been 
Was it mm-hmm. daunting to go from shorts to feature? Uh, weirdly not. I keep saying that like the shorts made us feel so enabled. We just feel so like we have everything we need just because we made the shorts like in such a ridiculous way. <laughs> like we just like the way that we've been shooting things has been so silly. Like we'll shoot the same like two sides of the same scene, like a conversation you know half the conversation will shoot at somebody's house and then the other half of the conversation will be like two months later at like a bar oh my god and it'll just be a mess but then it comes together in the edit and and i've been doing freelance editing for a long time so that's kind of been you know i it's kind of what i'm doing when i'm shooting it is just like editing it in my head and being like well we got to go back and forth between these two shots so we know what we need here and and uh, we'll get the rest of it later. And then we kind of just go piece by piece and put it together and then it kind of, it it gets cut together and, and it so far, so good, so. so it's all working so <laughs> far. Yeah, so we're just kind of continuing on that route and um, it's daunting. Um, this is our first time working with any money. We, we've never oh. had a yeah, budget. Yeah, because you guys have just been like self doing it and just yeah. cobbling it together and like when you feel like it you're shooting and mm-hmm. and now yep. you got money oh my yeah, gosh now we have money and a schedule and and, and a big crew flights yeah oh, we have flights yeah. to take and exactly so. are you um using people that you've worked with before in los angeles and are yeah. you bringing them there or are you using we like are. local people there's a little bit of a mix there's some folks that we're gonna have there's like a, a sound engineer who's gonna be there in massachusetts um and we're we're we have our own sort of Tom Savini guy who's yeah. going to be there in Massachusetts. <laughs> um, but mostly we're flying our, our friends out who are kind of the folks who have been doing it with us the whole time. Yeah, the whole who are time. Kind of excited to just be, you know, working on a super, you know, low budget, but, you know, kind of next step project with us. So, so your your last two shorts that screened at Whammy yeah. were, so the there's three that were on VHS, and those three are all like horror. Yes. Like horror, exploitation, and then the, yep. your other two that screened at Whammy are not horror, right? They're right. like kind of like women in prison Yes, exactly, yeah. So what was, what was like the switch for that? Well, it's so funny. I Really what happened is that I have been <laughs> focusing on the Blood Barn project, the, the big feature, and Alex, my partner, who's, you know, we've been working together, um, she really wanted to do this uh, women in prison movie and this noir short that was like a, a like a biker noir mm-hmm. movie, sort of like a mix of like The Long Goodbye and like Wild Angels. <laughs> and so like we kind of always were just like, yeah, we should do it. We should do it. And um, but I was really like working on the Blood Barn thing, but Alex really um, pulled it together, and so those really are like her motivation, her baby. Yeah, yeah. and so I I shot uh, the one of them and and edited both of them, but she shot on her own the other one, the the uh, women in prison movie. Yeah, and so yeah, and we had another screening for those just like a couple weeks ago, and it was really fun. I'm I'm glad that we did it, but it was so funny because it was like. We've just been biting off a lot recently, and yeah. it's, it's been a good time, though. <laughs> Do you prefer to work on horror, though, like as a genre? Uh, you know, I think I'm, I actually come from more of a comedy world. So. Yeah, you're part of like this comedy group. Yeah, and yeah. Is it I've, stand-up? It, as I we, told you, we, I'm afraid yeah. of stand-up. <laughs> yeah. No, we, we've only we've done a couple live shows. We've, I, I don't do stand-up, though, and... Um, we're all sort of part of more of like the like more performance based comedy stuff. So is it more like improv? Yeah, there's so there's this big uh, clown community in LA. Are you a clown? I'm not a clown. Okay, wait, I'm, we have to I'm get this. Officially okay. not a You're clown. not a clown or a juggalo. No, no, <laughs> <laughs> none of those, none of those. But I. I do uh, associate with clowns. So you have friends that are clowns. I have clown friends, for <laughs> real. But they're they're not, you know, sort of put on a red nose and makeup clowns. They're like, they're like, 
what is it, Gallier? Like, 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 like French clowns. You know, I actually know someone who went yeah. to Europe to go to clown school. It's me, me so too. I guess I, I maybe it's bunch. the same person. <laughs> no, yeah, maybe. I, they're they're out here. They're 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 in that. LA. They're you in you LA. wouldn't know because they don't put on the red nose. I but know, you wouldn't. You would never know. So but you, it's sort of performance art comedy. It's not improv. It's not stand up. It's yeah. It's, but it's also in this clown world. It's it's clown. Yeah. Clown adjacent. Yeah. <laughs> You're just clowning yeah. around. It's it is kind of clowning around. It's like being a goofball on stage so do you bring that humor into your shorts you feel yeah i think that what we've been doing is we've been making like a lot of comedy sketch videos Mm -hmm. and so i think i learned i i we made a bunch of them during covid we started sort of having like a comedy group we were just had nothing else to do so we were posting videos like once a week and i was sort of the main editor on those videos Mm -hmm. and so i really learned how to make how to edit comedy and just you know there's a lot comedic of comedic timing. timing that's yeah. the thing it's timing yeah there's this insane roger corman quote that i'm obsessed with where he says that uh horror comedy and sex all have the same thing he's he's like the, he thinks there's a similarity between the three of them that both of them you you you're building up <laughs> anticipation <laughs> and yeah until like a final moment the climax yeah exactly and it's it's a fantastic quote that he's he made in this documentary that he made you know kind of recently he's like a 93 year old man like saying yeah. this insane thing but um i mean I, I, he's not wrong yeah he's like, not wrong being he's very right and so it's it's i think that that's kind of what i've been learning through doing the comedy videos is just um kind of yeah, the same, it just that thing that applies to horror very easily. Well, just... I, yeah, and also I think that some of my favorite horror movies have more comedic elements in them. Like, yeah. for example, um, Evil Dead and Evil Dead, oh, yeah. the Evil Dead trilogy. Mm-hmm. Um, the only movie scarier than Evil Dead is Evil Dead 2. And, yeah. <laughs> and I love that Army of Darkness was called Medieval Dead originally, yes, yeah, but totally. I wish it was still called that. I'm obsessed with those movies. Yeah. Uh, that That's like our total, like, tone palette guide yeah, so it's you know. like slightly comedic but also still really scary and also fright night have you yeah. seen fright night i haven't and i'm dying to because it's, they've been having these screenings and everything yeah no and... you should see fright night no, uh, i'm not, not going to give anything away okay. it's definitely not exploitation okay it's definitely not but his comedic timing yeah. in fright night is so good and i just went to the q a at be kind video yeah and he said the way that he got the comedy was they really just rehearsed interesting and he went for laughs right right because he was like if the audience is gonna laugh they're gonna have a good time yeah absolutely so yeah i mean i think sam raimi has that same sort of approach where it's like you know those guys are were like obsessed with three stooges and stuff and so like just having that sort of mentality of creating a a fun experience for the audience and bringing them on a on like a joy ride i think that's really what we want to do we're not trying to make anybody feel um icky you yeah know? that's like i mean that's a really good point i talk with people a lot uh when you go to the movies um sometimes people ask me how did you feel when they laughed right, right. and it's like sometimes okay there's respectful laughs and there's disrespectful laughs in totally, cinema totally but i think during horror it's okay to laugh Absolutely. because you're so tense that when it finally breaks all you can do is laugh or scream right and totally. i'd rather you laugh yes. <laughs> i was in black swan at the bev oh my god there was a girl next to me that was a screamer <laughs> i was like oh, literally <laughs> i had never seen black swan before and at the most random weird time she like shrieked at like oh the top god. of her lungs in silence and i was like yeah. oh my god wow i mean i saw evil dead recently at vidiots mm-hmm. they did a screening and it was so fascinating because there was there was some loud audience members and there were these guys who were insisting on i think they were drunk it was a late night screening, probably or and, stoned yeah, or something something was happening off with the goop guys. as we say yeah and honestly i i sort of respected the, their way of viewing this movie i was like maybe this should be more of a party you know like they were clapping they were going for it anytime something happened on the screen but you know, they were just, you know, talking to, to the screen and stuff. And <laughs> wow, they were really going for it. They were really going for it. And, <laughs> and I, you know, I'm open to that at a at a horror movie, you know, especially sort of a, a schlockier one. I'm, I, you know, we actually just saw Rocky Horror. I saw it for the first time. Like in an audience in or an for audience, the first time at all? Uh, for the first time at all at the New Art 
on a did Friday they do like night. A, what do they do, like a lap dance they, or something if you've never crazy. seen it before? Oh, yeah, no. I, I They did do that to some people. That would yeah. be my worst nightmare. Yes, no. That's I, why I'm not going. <laughs> yeah, no. They, they don't force you, luckily. Mm-hmm. You kind of... you. I think that that some things have changed over the years, but <laughs> but um, but yeah, it was it was insane. Did you it, love it? Um, I I I experienced it. You know, I think yeah. I I think I I experienced it. I don't know. Have it you was, seen Phantom of the Paradise? I love that movie. Okay, so yeah. I have this theory that you're either a Rocky Horror Picture Show yes. person or a Phantom of the Paradise. Maybe person. I'm a Phantom of the Paradise, and I'm a person. Phantom of the Paradise yeah. person. Yeah. I think I brought it up on the way home. Actually, I was like, I want to see more movies that have that exact tone of like sort of that i don't know even know what it is there's a lot of darkness and very specific like elo style like music and yeah. like uh what else like, i'm obsessed like well paul williams's music in uh mm, family parents i'm yeah. obsessed with his lyrics i love listening to yes. them i have them on repeat like it's i awesome. just i listen in the dark at night <laughs> to awesome. him singing yeah I, we were on the way home we were talking about how we just should make a musical now you Just should yeah. you should i mean you're a musician <laughs> yeah yeah we're ready to do why it why haven't you i don't know yeah i mean i'm i kind of have a something rock against opera. musicals but but now <gasps> Wait, you have something I'm, against musicals yeah i don't know i mean like i think i've always just since i was a kid i've been like so we were talking about this on the way home from that movie that like my experience the second they start singing is that I can't wait for them to be done singing. Really? Yeah, I'm just ready for the movie to continue. And oh. but it's funny because that feeling is so visceral and it kind of it's charming to me that my body wants the movie to go on so badly. I'm like, I can't wait for this movie to conti- to continue even though I'm not enjoying <laughs> it that much because it's a musical. It's weird. It's it's also interesting since you are a musician, I would think yeah. maybe. But I also this is a really <laughs> weird thing. But I find that men don't tend to like musicals They're, as much as um, women. I don't know. Yeah, Alex likes them more than I do. So maybe. Yeah, I don't maybe know. That's true. Well, you should watch something like Jesus Christ Superstar because yeah. that never there's no dialogue in it. It's just music. It's just the music. entire thing. Yeah, I I I once went to a screening at the Metrograph in New York. I had two options. I could either see Bride of Frankenstein or. Um, Umbrellas of Cherbourg. Uh huh. Which one did and, you see? And I saw Umbrellas of Cherbourg. Oh, I, did you I, like it? I, I, the second it started, I was like, I've made a huge mistake. <laughs> what am I doing? I and love I, that. Movie. I considered leaving and going into Bride of Frankenstein just to, just to like cleanse yourself. Yeah, of it. but I, I watched the whole movie and and I, it was great. It was. Fantastic. Have you seen La La Land? No, I haven't. Because La La Land is just a retelling of Umbrellas of Cherbourg, okay. basically, in yeah. my opinion, it's just. Well, I've seen it, since seeing that movie. I've seen it like referenced in all these other movies, and yeah. I'm actually really happy that I saw it. Um, but it was just so funny because that's another one where there's not a single word of dialogue. Yeah. It's just oh, Bride of Frankenstein's playing at the Bev this week. Oh, so, really? Yeah, okay, on a double bill with Frankenstein. Oh, okay. so I think it's sold out. But okay. maybe I'll wait in line. Yeah, go wait in line. Yeah, I still haven't seen it. So. Yeah, so you can yeah. always see it then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Are you shooting in color? We are, yeah. yeah. We're we're shooting and we're shooting digital as well. Oh, we're you're just, shooting digital, mm-hmm, so it's gonna be completely yeah. different. I know, yeah. We're doing a lot, what, anything we can do to give it some sort of character, you know, just specific lenses. We're gonna why use did you and, decide digital instead of video? Well, we've been working on VHS for a while, and it's it's super exciting to to work that way to kind of work with, with those limitations. But I think we wanted to give this movie as much of a chance as it can have to Mm -hmm. kind of uh exceed and reach uh, a wide audience yeah you know be able to oh uh, we want to play at festivals and stuff and you know and we're going to try and make it have the same retro feel but that's great yeah but it'll be digital (laughs) evil digital evil digital (laughs) evil dead but digital yeah (laughs) <laughs> Our time is up, but right. Gabe, is there any final thought that you'd like to leave the audience with? Um, I don't know. I, I th- this was a, a fun conversation. Yeah. I, I feel like uh, get into physical media. That that's my my thought is that if you're not already buying VHS and DVDs and vinyl and cassettes and uh, then it is only a good thing for your life and for your brain. I think it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gabe, for coming on the show. If you'd like to keep up with Gabe, you can check him out on Instagram at Gabernini, <laughs> or you can check out his music on Spotify and Apple. I'm Gala Avery, and this has been The Gala Show. The Gala Show is brought to you by Avery.com.
This episode was executive produced by Roger Avery and produced by Gala Avery. Music composed by Andy Milburn. As always, I'm your host, Gala Avery. Copyright 2024. All rights reserved. Despite me sharing the same last name with this charity, I don't have any affiliation with it, besides the fact that the issue is very near and dear to my heart. Did you know that in the United States, 2.7 million children currently have a parent in prison, and it's estimated that 10 million children have experienced parental incarceration at some point in their lives? I was one of these kids, and as an adult, I am really grateful to be able to give back to Project Avery. Their mission is to build leadership from within by supporting community through programs such as mentoring and outdoor education, and also to remove the stigma surrounding having a parent that's incarcerated. You don't have to feel alone. If you know a kid who could use these resources or would like to donate money or time to the charity, please go to Project Avery, that's A-V-A-R-Y dot org, to check out what this amazing charity is all about. Again, that's projectavery.org. Thank you guys from the bottom of my heart.